Hi, good day everyone, and welcome to this video for Unit 2 Biology, where we will be discussing some diseases, as well as a very short um, introduction into monoclonal antibodies, which is just a continuation, a little addition on from um, our immunity talk, okay? So let's just take a look at monoclonal antibodies for two minutes, all right? So you remember that the immune system actually works with polyclonal antibodies where there are multiple antibodies for diseases right but monoclonal antibodies are produced from one clone of a b cell and all the members of that clone will produce identical antibodies so these antibodies could be used in diagnosis of um, diseases treatments of diseases but as i said before polyclonal antibodies are present in a normal Im immune response Right, so here are some um, functions of monoclonal antibodies. Number one being to diagnose pregnancy in the pregnancy test, those are strips. You can also diagnose chlamydia, gonorrhea, strep throat, cancers, and even treatments of diseases. Okay, so let's just take a look very quickly at how monoclonal antibodies can diagnose pregnancy. So the urine of a pregnant person contains the hormone HC. G, which stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. Now you know this from, from past classes, right? So what happens, the test strip will be dipped in urine and the urine will move up the test strip, right? And the HCG will encounter antibodies and these antibodies are called anti-HCG. So it means that they are only um, receptive to HCG molecules. Now, when that binds, there's going to be a complex, and these complexes could now bind to part of the test strip. And if it is positive, it will be shown as a line on the test strip, right, on the window. Now, in addition to the what the window with um, the ETG, there's a control window just to make sure that the test is actually working and it is, has been done right. Okay, so. Let me show you a picture of how it looks, right? So we have a pregnant person on the left and a non-pregnant person on the right. So let's take a look at the non-pregnant first. There are no HCG molecules here. So we have the purple boxes as the HCG there, right? So we have the anti-HCG antibodies present, but there are no HCG molecules to bind to. So therefore, they can't make this complex. We can't have the square here to join the two like we do on the left-hand side. So therefore, on the test strip, it will read as negative. Now there will always be a band here just to show that you did the test right on the control window. Okay. Now on the left hand side, we have the HCG. The HCG is going to bind to the anti-HCG antibodies and they are going to form the complex which will represent as a positive um, mark on the strip. Okay, and that helps in the diagnosis of pregnancy. Now, there are other uses of monoclonal antibodies in treatment, right? So, they can treat toxins, radioactive isotopes can be used to make um, cytotoxic chemicals, just like how you have your cytotoxic T cells, we could make man-made chemicals to target specific cancer cells, toxins, all of that, right? And they could kill certain tumor cells, all right? Um, they could actually be injected with enzymes, so when the antibodies reach those cancer cells, the, um, the enzymes could um, reach those specific target cells, okay? And you don't have to, to always rely on radiation and chemotherapy, which could, which could damage good cells as well, okay? So important diseases that you should remember that they can treat, just to have on it as an example in your exam, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that's a type of cancer, breast cancer, easy one to remember, and rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Just to remember those. Right, um, they could also be used to prevent the rejection of transplanted tissues, for example, kidney transplant. Right, so um, if I don't know if you know about this, but um, when you transplant in organs, there's always a chance that your body could reject it. So, to prevent your body from rejecting it, monoclonal antibodies play an important role. All right, those are just a couple examples, and you could read up a little more on monoclonal antibodies in treatment. All right, but today we will be actually be talking about two important diseases one hiv aids and the other dengue 
all right so uh, most of us know what AIDS is it stands for the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome and it's co caused by the very popular retrovirus HIV which stands for human immunodeficiency syndrome this virus all right which is HIV we're talking about contains two RNA molecules all right and they contain all the instructions in this RNA for the manufacture of new viruses and there are three enzymes that are required reverse transcriptase integrase and protease so just like in dna replication we did that in the past reverse transcriptase are used to transcribe viral rna into a complementary viral dna so rna goes to dna integrase is going to cut basically cut and paste viral dna into the dna of the host cells so it's actually going to modify our cells and insert its dna into our dna all right so it's really bad and finally protease will break down proteins belonging to the host amino acids sorry the host dna into amino acids which are used to synthesize new viral proteins all right and also the virus contains important glycoproteins on the surface so gp120 glycoprotein 120 it actually fits into a cd4 receptor which is its um its primary target cell all right so let's just take a look at how the hiv virus is going to come into our body and replicate and cause all the damage it does so the first thing it does when the when the virus enters the bloodstream is that it will going to approach a t4 cell right so the glycoprotein 120 as i told you about is going to fit into the cd4 receptor on the surface of the cell all right and this actually going to be is going to trigger the endocytosis which allows the virus to en enter the cell so you might rem remember what endocytosis is that the virus is going to eat essentially wrap around the um the virus the cell and will eat the virus right so now that the virus is in the cell the viral rna is going to be released into the cytoplasm together with the enzyme the three enzymes that we talked about all right so we already talked about the functions of the three enzymes so when the dna copy enters the nucleus of the host cell this is where the dna is going to change it's going to cut our dna put the viral dna in and eventually um it's actually going to have a long incubation period so any disease has an incubation period some diseases the incubation period could be two days like the common cold or something right however the incubation period for hiv is five to ten years right it's a very long time right so the viral dna will become activated new viral rna are going to be produced the protease enzymes are going to break down our proteins and make amino acids for the virus to replicate so therefore they will have new viral particles being assembled and um, the viral particles now when they are mature they will do the opposite as how they came into the cell exocytosis they're going to bud off from our cell and go and infect other t cells so it will it will quickly build up and all our t-cells are going to be affected eventually without treatment all right so this is a little image of the life cycle of the hiv virus you could see from one to six there those are the major steps that they have outlined in the um in the picture there right so you have one and two be in the endocytosis you could see that the virus is being eaten up by the cell and then you have three where you have the reverse transcriptase four where it enters the nucleus of the cell and you can see that our dna there is being changed and that is going to create um, that's going to make more viral dna and the virus is going to replicate and so on and so forth right you could just follow the diagram and follow my notes as well and you'll get the life cycle right so let's take a look at how the hiv virus is transmitted the primary way that we all know is sexual conduct with someone who is already infected by hiv also contact with infected blood via external ways right such as blood transfusions sharing of needles or reusing syringes however yes blood transfusion are technically a way but there's i mean almost no chance that that will actually happen in our healthcare system because all the blood are screened multiple times for these diseases right so there's no way that you would get hiv from a blood transfusion in the hospital all right you have nothing to worry about that okay um also from an hiv infected mother who does not undergo any treatment during pregnancy during birth and also after birth via breast milk right so 
um, being an HIV infected mother is extremely dangerous without treatment. Now, however, with treatment, there's almost no chance that you could pass on the virus to the baby. All right. Such is the, um, the treatment of HIV. It's actually very good now. Right. So let's just talk about that incubation period that I spoke to you all about. So the, the incubation period could, could be variable, right? It could be a few months, a few years, up to 10 years, all right? So there's a very small incubation phase initially where it feels like it's just a common cold, right? The person is going to experience flu-like symptoms when they are now infected, and the virus will be present in very large quantities. This is where the person is most infectious, right? If you undergo any of the activities that we spoke to before. Now, after this period, this is where we have the, um, we are, asy sorry, this is a mistake. It's supposed to be asymptomatic period where there are no symptoms, right? And this is where it lasts for several years, okay? So during this time, this is where the virus is replicating and infecting more and more T cells. However, the T cell count is greater than 500. This is where we want our T cells to be, right? So there are no real symptoms here because the T-cell count is very high. However, after more and more years have passed and more T-cells are becoming infected by the virus, the T-cell is going to drop below 500 but still be above 200. All right? And that will last for a couple of years as well. Now the immune system is said to be weakened at this stage. And this is where you're going to get opportunistic infections you have to remember this too for your exam opportunistic infections are infections that are a immunologically competent person meaning that you know they are not compromised their immune system is fine they would not get those diseases normally right so if your t cell is below 500 you are said to be immunocompromised right so immunocompromised Promise another word that you should use whenever you get the chance in your exam it will impress your examiners like that all right so there are yeast infections in the mouth which should never happen fever diarrhea herpes cervical cancer a lot of those are opportunistic infections right and we are said they are said to have aids related complex not actual full-blown aids but aids related complex however once the t-cell count drops below 200 the person is actually described as having aids all right and they would have already developed at least one of these following infections right so yeast infections in the lungs all right the esophagus recurrent pneumonia and a cancer called carposi sarcoma all right so these are the the ones by 200 those infections are extremely important to remember and you should be able to give examples of some opportunistic infections from having AIDS, all right? So let's see how we could treat AIDS now. Now there is no vaccine, like how there are vaccines for influenza, to prevent the development of AIDS. However, there are many antiviral drugs which will prevent the virus from replicating, all right? So they would in essentially inhibit the enzymes right and there's what you know you just need one tablet per day and you can live a normal full life having AIDS all right so it's just like high blood pressure or something you just take a pill and you are fine and you could carry on life just as a normal person would all right however there are many factors that affect the control of AIDS all right so social factors one way is to practice monogamy, which is um, sex with one person. And we can educate the public on methods of infection and also prevention of infection. We can use the media to appropriately spread the said in education, educational information. We should also ensure proper disposal of used syringes and needles. And you know, now that we are more receptive as a whole, we can ensure that um, clean syringes and needles are readily available even though obviously IV drugs are very bad but um, doing IV drugs are bad and getting AIDS is also bad so I mean you kind of don't want to have two bad things right so if you could at least prevent 
these um, drug users from getting AIDS, you know, that would, that would help a little bit, right? Not with them, with the healthcare system, everything. So if you could actually ensure that they are cheap and ready as accessible syringes and needles, that will help as well. But that's a controversial one. I wouldn't really put that one there, all right? And also getting expecting mothers tested for HIV. So in the hospital, any pregnant um, patient I would see, I would immediately ask for um, the HIV results. Okay, and if you don't have it, we will do a test for you on the spot because HIV is extremely important to rule out in a pregnancy. All right, so economic factors now. Obviously, these drugs, tests, screening tests, everything costs a lot of money. So allocation of money for um, for healthcare and education and training of healthcare workers could be difficult in poorer countries. Okay, in some countries, other diseases are much more rampant and require the most money. Okay, and obviously the availability of funding will influence the level of education about the public about the spread of the infection. Okay, and it could also affect the level of research that is done. So biological factors now. So it is important that screening via blood tests be carried out. And by screening, we could identify persons who are HIV positive. Obviously the use of proper, the proper use of barrier conception, contraception will prevent the entry of the virus, right? So remember only barrier um, contraceptives can actually prevent sexually transmitted infections, right? Other forms of contraception can prevent pregnancy but not um, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, blood products must be treated to destroy any viral particles present and an effective vaccine should be developed to protect the immune system and prevent infection but we have not done that just yet. Okay. Right, so let's take a look at dengue fever now. So dengue fever is caused by a virus which belongs to the class arbovirus so there are many different viruses but the dengue virus is called an arbovirus now there are four strains of dengue virus and it's called den1 to den4 all right den1 2 3 4 so therefore you could actually get dengue four times before you become fully immune all right so if you get dengue from den2 it means that the den2 virus if a mosquito were to bite you again after you recover you would not get dengue However, there are three more dengue strains that you could get infected by. So in order to become fully immune from dengue, you need to have dengue four times. If you know somebody who has dengue four separate occasions, it means they will never get dengue again. All right. But just because you have gotten dengue fever once does not mean you can't get it again. All right. That's just a fact. And you know, you could educate your family and friends on that fact. All right. So the virus contains a single strand of RNA. So, just like the HIV virus, it's going to use the cells in our body to synthesize viral proteins and replicate itself, all right? And we all know from since primary school that it is spread by the bite of a female infected Aedes aegypti mosquito. So, you should learn a little bit about the Aedes aegypti mosquito. We all know it already. I don't think we need to go into everything about the Aedes aegypti mosquito. We've been hearing about this since we were born, all right? So, I'll skip that. What we do need to know are the signs and symptoms of dengue. So just before we begin, um, signs and symptoms are two different things. Just, just because you hear it in the same sentence all the time does not mean that a sign and a symptom are the same thing. So a sign is something physical that other people can see. Right? So if you get a cut right, and it's bleeding, the bleeding is the sign. However, when you get a cut, you'll also feel some pain. But I can't see pain. So pain is a symptom. It's a symptom that a symptom is something that you can feel, but I can't see. All right. So if you look at this list here, you can see some um, some differences there. So a rash that's going to be a sign. Vomiting is a sign. Fever is a sign. Yes, you can feel. You will feel cold, but I can take a therm thermometer and test your temperature, meaning it will become a sign. Headache, on the other hand, is a symptom because I can't feel your headache. Backache is a symptom. Joint pain is a symptom. Eye pain is a symptom. Reduced platelet count is a sign because I can run a blood test and see. Okay? Shock. Shock does not mean to be surprised. 
shock means that um, you have less oxygen carrying capacity of your blood cells and that is actually a sign as well because it will depend on your blood pressure your pulse all of those things right which can be measured objectively okay right so let's take, let's take a look at the life cycle of the virus and it's you don't have to go into detail with this it's just you need to know how it enters the body and how it can exit the body so the first thing the virus will be transmitted to the humans when an infected mosquito injects its saliva into our bloodstream the virus now is going to start replicating in the lymph nodes and spleen all right so important to note right lymph nodes and spleen in the human there it will infect the white blood cells and lymphatic tissues and they will call they will manufacture more viruses for the dengue virus then when the virus is mature it's going to be released from these cells circulate in the blood bloodstream and now that person has become infectious so if a mosquito were to bite that person now like a non-infected mosquito the mosquito will pick up the virus and then they could transmit it to somebody else who does not have the virus okay you can look at the picture for more details all right so just like the aids virus let's take a look sorry hiv let's take a look at the transmission so again the female mosquito will become infected by the virus when it feeds on an infected person okay this is called the acute febrile phase when a person is symptomatic meaning that they they show symptoms right and signs so just like AIDS, there's an incubation period. However, look at the incubation period here, just 8 to 10 days in the mosquito, right? So the virus now is moving to the salivary glands of the mosquito. So after the mosquito, uh, after the virus replicates in the mosquito, it needs to move to the salivary glands of the mosquito so that it can inject the saliva into us, okay? And then now there's another incubation period. So the first incubation period I'm talking about here is within the mosquito where the virus replicates in the mosquito. However, when the virus enters the body, there's another incubation period, about 3 to 14 days. And then you are going to start seeing the symptoms. So you're seeing the signs and feeling the symptoms. All right? And remember, always remember, that the virus is replicating in the person's white blood cells. Okay? Treatment of dengue, because it's a virus... Um, it, it is no real treatment, just like how COVID didn't really have a, a targeted treatment until recently. So it's just pain relief, fluids, bed rest, and in the occasion, platelet transfusions, which is where your platelets get very low. You might need platelet transfusions, but that's not, um, not common, right? So the dengue virus would, your body would deal with it on its own and it will eventually go away, right? So we want to prevent the dengue virus since it's not easily treated. So how do we control the vector? So remember the Aedes aegypti mosquito is a vector because it picks up the virus and it's not affected by the virus, but it spreads the virus. That makes it a vector, all right? So because we know where the Aedes aegypti mosquito lives by simply draining and removing containers that could collect stagnant water, that will prevent their laying of eggs and also the development of their young larvae. You can also destroy the larvae by using larvicide. Chemicals can be sprayed in areas where the outbreaks occur. So you know you would have seen those vans. You know, if you live in a bushy area, you would see the vans spraying the, um, the chemicals. You yourself can use insect repellent, which I do, to prevent mosquitoes from biting you. Right? And, you know, a really advanced way is to infect a mosquito with a bacteria that would um, reduce its lifespan. But I think that's kind of extreme. Right? So let's take a look at factors that contribute to the spread of dengue. So uncontrolled urbanization and increased population growth means that there are a lot of people in a small area and there's a strain on water and waste management. So more breeding grounds are going to be provided there. Also, shortage of personnel in the public health system. So there's less persons available to do all these things that we mentioned, like inspection of homes nobody's coming to your home and inspect your containers to see if they are closed or not because there's no people uh, nobody there to do that right um increased air travel would facilitate the movement of mosquitoes if a mosquito gets moved into a plane and you go across the next caribbean island or something or wherever that doesn't have mosquitoes infected people 
right, could move from one place to another, so it doesn't have to be a mosquito, a mosquito. If you have dengue and you move to a, another place, and there are mosquitoes there, the mosquito will bite you and then cause a whole dengue outbreak in a new country, right? Global warming has caused a rising temperatures in areas, causing increased spread of dengue, right? Uh, mosquitoes like hot, well not hot, but you know, warm places if you haven't noticed, there's not really a mosquito problem in places like America or anything, right? And just like with HIV, no dengue fever vaccine is available. Right, so we, we kind of already know the impact of dengue, right? If you go to school and you have dengue, you know, you can't really, you can't function with having dengue. So you'll be home, that will hamper your productivity. People who are working, that will also hamper their productivity. They'll have to stay home. And, you know, if you are the breadwinner, that could cause problems for your family, depending on how much, um, how many, how much time you need to spend away from work. All right. All right. And finally, let's take a look at the social, economic, and biological factors in controlling dengue. So social factors. Education, again, is honestly basically the same as HIV, right? So if you could remember the ones for HIV, you could just change the words and put it in the ones for dengue, all right? So it's easy to learn. So education and the methods of infection and transmission, and also how the life cycle of the vector works. The use of various types of media just as we said before to inform the public on that said education and identification of um, prospective blood donors who may have had dengue so before if you haven't given blood before which everybody should everybody should donate blood right it's healthy it's actually healthy for you um so when you go to give blood there will be a questionnaire questioning you about your travel history infection history all those things just to make sure that you don't have dengue or any other virus for that matter okay economic factors so if we increase the allocation of money in health education and training of healthcare workers to deal with dengue that will help um, research and the development of vaccines to prevent dengue and also allocation of funding to purchase drugs that could be used in the treatment of dengue right so funding is important for research funding is important for healthcare and finally, biological factors. So when somebody does have dengue, there should be space to isolate patients from others who have a dengue. Even though they go into the hospital, you know, they may not be isolated. And if a mosquito bites them in the hospital, then they can have a dengue outbreak in the hospital. All right. Again, using the biological control, she thought about um, reducing the lifespan, genetic engineering to in, um to engineer male mosquitoes that pass on genes to female offspring so that they cannot fly, which is kind of sad, but yeah, it, it works, right? Um, and also knowledge of the life cycle of the vector could help control it. And finally, screening of the blood donors to find out if they may have the virus or not, right? So very easy factors to remember here. And it's two very easy diseases, right? So I will do one more video with a couple more diseases such like cancer, hypertension, diabetes, those sorts of stuff. And that will be the last class there in Unit 2 Biology. All right.